Hi everyone, welcome to the rocky road to DocOps. This presentation describes AB Namro's journey towards DocOps from the point of view of the company's first documentation manager and technical writer, and that would be me, Chris Noonan. So the agenda for this uh, talk is a brief introduction to AB Namro. I'll talk a little bit about myself. I'll then describe the formulas that I use in my day-to-day -day work, and then the journey. So the journey from what was there when I started to what we currently have and to where we still need to go to. AB Namro is the third largest bank in the Netherlands. It's an international company. It has a lot of employees. Um, the main language used is English. Although it's a Dutch company, as in the case in many Dutch companies, uh, the business language is English. Um, the Dutch have incredibly good English, actually. Um, it puts a lot of native English speakers to shame. Um, but the documentation, obviously, since business is English, um, the documentation is also kept in English. Uh, they have a lot of uh, uh, cultures in there. Uh, a lot of different languages are spoken, but the main language is English. A bit about myself. So I've been a technical writer for about six years now. Um, I've worked across a lot of different areas, um, five different companies. Um, and I have two dogs. Uh, their names are Rudy and Holly. They both unfortunately live with my parents, but I hope to move them over to me shortly. Um, the problem is uh, I need a garden, and in Amsterdam, to own a garden, it's incredibly expensive. Um, so AB Namro and me, I was a first dedicated technical writer in AB Namro, um, which is quite unusual for a company of its size. Um, Everyone really appreciated the importance of documentation, but they didn't really know it was a certain area that you could get professionals in that area to help you. So it was a bit of a challenge in that sense. Uh, I've, I've been there for a year and a half, but I've recently been joined by a new colleague, Brendan Lynch. He started almost seven months ago now. So I'm liking the camaraderie um, to have two technical writers there is, is a, big, a big help and it shows that the company is investing. Um, and it's also good to have two Irish guys together. So that's also nice. Uh, another important point that I haven't mentioned in the previous slide is that um, in AB Namro, the developers create and maintain their own documentation. So my role is more of uh, the support, to set up processes, to train, uh, to define ways of working, uh, to mediate, etc. When I first started, the goals that were defined for me were very broad. It was a clean slate. Uh, the word greenfield was used, um, and that's not very clear. Um, it's a bit daunting, but I do like a challenge. Um, the main thing they wanted was to improve documentation, uh, to improve the quality and improve how they do it. Um, it was a, a bit frightening to hear the word greenfield so much and to not have a clear scope on it. Um, and if I hear the word greenfield in the future, possibly in a new role, I would think fairly long and hard about it um, because there's quite a lot involved. Um, it's quite taxing. So the formulas that I use in my day-to-day -day work, um, I think these are true for all content and all interactions, really. If you want to have good content, you have to define a style. People need to agree on it, and you need to have a process behind it. You can't have good style without a good process, and you can't have a good process without good content. Um, they're linked. Good interaction, of course. Um, you can't have the, the above without having good interaction. If, if you don't have a good way of approaching people, explaining yourself, explaining what your objective is, uh, you won't accomplish much. So for good style, first you need collaboration, you need to come together, um, you need to come in together with people, uh, they need to agree on something, so that's the consensus, um, and then you can get into the nitty gritty, like the tone and voice, uh, the audience, you can defi define what those groups are, and your style guide. Um, and for good process, again, you need that collaboration. You need to come together, you need to agree on it, uh, you need consensus, uh, you need it to be defined, written down on paper. People need to agree with it, look at it, and agree to be part of it in most cases. And then again, you get down to the nitty gritty, so that's tooling, um, what works best for the way of working, um, reviews, and automation. In documentation, there are always a lot of uh, manual tasks and they creep in a lot. It's quite easy to automate this. It's not expensive and I highly recommend it. And for good interactions, it's pretty simple really. Um, treat your interactions within a work scenario as you would outside. Uh, treat each other with respect, be transparent. Don't have hidden agendas. Uh, whatever your goal is, write it on a page or on a slide. Be very clear and open about it. Um, and you'll find a level of understanding from that. Uh, don't try to sneak little things in or try to uh, hoodwink people. Um, they won't like it and you won't be liked and whatever you're trying to do won't go very far. Uh, give people time as well. I, I think that's an important one. 
uh, we're all busy people. We all have agendas. Um, we all have uh, busy schedules. But it's important to give people time. Um, and by doing that, I, I think you can find a common ground also. So the journey, this is the Doc Cops journey. Um, I've made a little illustration here, um, but simply it's it's defined in by certain categories here. So first we have requirements gathering, a tooling investigation, process definition, uh, developing your solution. Then you need to train and coach the authors, and then you need to create resources to support them. I've uh, added little uh, animals at each point to denote the little obstacles that we need to overcome. Um, each one of these phases is a challenge. Uh, you will you will find uh, you will find unexpected things happening, um, and that's what kind of excites me as well. Um, when you take on one of these phases, uh, you never really know what you're going to what you're going to come into, and I think that's kind of a fun part as well. So when I started in AB and Amro, there was one external API portal. Uh, there was no documentation export in the company besides myself, but I just arrived at that point and developers maintain their own documentation. So the requirements gathering stage. Um, what I did here was I, I'm, I just focused on meeting with people and talking, taking a lot of notes, um, being very thorough in my notes, uh, being methodical in the approach as well. Um, but I did it in an informal way and I was quite uh, transparent in what I was doing. So I was very open when I had my meet and greets. I would say, I'm here to do this. I'm here to help you improve your way of doing it. I want to make it easier for you. And they were very appreciative. Uh, they didn't like the process and they wanted this to happen. So it was an open door. I met with authors, content creators, uh, product owners, uh, some users, uh, everyone really who's interacted with the documentation uh, from people creating it to the actual end user. I took part in the publishing process because this is normally problematic in any documentation circle. This is normally where problems arise. Um, and a lot of the overall process is defined by how publishing is, is run. I assess the tooling, uh, the way of working, and I ask questions about the overall process of development. Um, th that's something that was quite interesting. I'll get to that in a little while. A, a lot of them weren't completely sure of what that whole process was, and that was problematic. It was also affecting the documentation. So based on what I found, I found that the API portal they had uh, wasn't adequate. Uh, the publishing process was incredibly complicated. There was no documentation on it. Um, the publishing process I went to, it took, I think, roughly eight hours, and there were nine people in the room in total. Um, the content had a lot of issues. Uh, nobody really knew what to do in the portal. Uh, there was little interaction from the portal back to the person putting the content in. Uh, incredibly complicated um, and not practical. A very difficult thing to use and a burden on everyone. Uh, content management, people were keeping the files locally. Um, there was no way to track what was the most recent version of which product. Uh, it was a nightmare really for, to for people to handle and to work together or to collaborate on. Uh, they had no documentation training at all, uh, no technical writing experience. Um, they were just looking to see what other people had done and just copying that, but without any agreed style. Uh, there was no review process really to speak of, nothing to find. Um, so it was pretty, pretty much one person working on their own um, getting something done and, and getting it out as quickly as they could. Uh, they just wanted to get it through, get it out and get it over with. Nobody really read it. Um, so the experience for the user probably wasn't the best. Um, and there was little pride in the work. Um, not only was there little pride, but the work itself wasn't tracked. And because it wasn't tracked, people couldn't give it good time. So if you think of a development team, each task is being well tracked. It's being tracked down in a very minute detail. If you imagine uh, maybe a sprint methodology um, and an agile way of working, documentation wasn't in there. It wasn't in the definition of done. It wasn't considered a priority. And because of that, um, yeah, it suffered. It wasn't getting the time it needed. It was like an extra that someone had to do and uh, they didn't enjoy it. Ownership was also a problem, um, especially because I had joined and someone joined with a title of technical writer. So they, they weren't really sure um, whether I was going to write all their documentation or who owned it at that point. If I gave feedback on it or if I made an edit, um, we needed to define how that worked and collaboration. Up until I started, no one was actually reviewing that content. So it was just one person, a solo effort, um, and that's very problematic, as you can imagine. The overall documentation process wasn't defined, so there was no one place where I could go to find out as a developer what I need to do to develop a product. 
um, how I need to make my documentation, how I need to um, develop the actual product itself, where I need to expose it, um, and just standard practices within the bank. It wasn't really defined. Um, so the takeaways from this, in each section I'm going to give a takeaway, and uh, these are my key learnings and something that I, I think you might find useful. Um, so the first one here is to be informal. Um, take a relaxed approach with people um, and have a few jokes, have a cup of tea with them maybe, um, but make sure that you book in time. Um, you don't want to just walk up to someone's desk um, or just call them impromptu and expect to have time. It's good to book in short slots, maybe 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and, and just be very informal. Try and connect first um, and then ask some questions. Um, I, I think sometimes people can be a bit protective if you just go straight into the questions. It's good to get to know each other a little bit first and then get to the questions. It's important not to rush it. If you rush it, you may not get some of the answers that you're looking for. Uh, take part in the processes. Um, so maybe just sit by someone, um, ask them to open a file, maybe make an edit on something, um, take part in the publishing process, um, etc., and ask for documentation on the process. So if they're making docs um, and they don't have a process, that's really not a good sign. That really says that there's no nothing to find, no agreements have been made, um, and it's problematic. Ask how tasks are tracked. Um, so this is, again, you're looking for a flag here, and that is if it's not being tracked, which was the case um, for me. Um, if it's not being tracked, the quality isn't being given to it um, because someone doesn't have time, they don't have much time to put into the work. Um, and ask if they enjoy writing. Um, if they don't enjoy it, they probably shouldn't be doing it, but it also indicates that you know they have other work to be doing and this is like an extra that they're doing and it's not really given time again. Um, I ideally, the writer should enjoy what they're doing. They should take some bit of pride in it. They may not always enjoy it, but they should feel some kind of satisfaction when something is published. If that's missing, um, there's something wrong and it needs to be explored. So the tooling investigation, um, we needed a new external portal and we also needed uh, an in internal portal. Um, so the goal was to use the same solution for both. Um, and to do this, I created a big costing sheet. I defined what I wanted, uh, what was needed, and based on my research uh, that I'd gathered, I figured out, okay, what was the best approach? So I figured out a stoplight approach was the best. Uh, I defined exactly what my um, requirements were, what functionality I needed, uh, what the way of working would be around that. Um, and I looked into SaaS products. Uh, so that's paid software. So rather than making it ourselves, uh, maybe it was beneficial to buy something in or possibly rent it. Uh, in that way, we wouldn't have to support it and we wouldn't have to develop it ourselves. We could just use what's existing and uh, pay a certain fee per year. That turned out to be quite expensive. Um, and I also noticed that a lot of the SaaS solutions were using open source tools. Uh, not only that, but a lot of these products were too evolved. They had too many features. We were looking for something very specific and a small subset. So we were we would have ended up paying a lot of money for a large range of functionality. But all we were looking for was a small subset. It, it didn't really make sense to us. Uh, we needed uh, versioning control. So as I mentioned earlier, all of this content was being worked locally. Um, it wasn't really going through some kind of a repository type structure where uh, reviews were involved or tracking was there. Um, they, they had no way of being sure what the most recent content was or like the golden source as people call it. Um, there was a lot of opportunity for automation um, and we wanted to take a doc as code or doc ops approach um, so that meant try to art, trying to automate as much as possible um, uh, and a, a certain degree of trust with your authors. It just came down to a do-it-yourself versus a third-party approach. Um, and for the external portal, we decided to go to third-party because it was more cost-effective and it gave us what we needed. We already had a good relationship with the external portal provider, um, but it did need some work. And during the development, we needed to focus on that. For the internal uh, portal, we decided to do it ourselves, um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, the takeaways really on that are to define what you're looking for before looking at solutions. Um, you want to know exactly what you need, um, because if you turn up to um, one of, a meeting with a SaaS provider, um, they have pretty good sales teams and their products are really cool. Uh, you will be blown away by what they can do. But if it's not really what you're looking for, yeah, you need to know what you're looking for before you get there. 
um, and that's quite important you might end up um, committing to more meetings and then realizing okay well maybe this isn't something i want and then you're losing more time involve technology experts um, i'm a documentation manager i am quite te technical but um, it definitely benefited to have experts in there um, so i involved the software architect um, so he really um, look, looked at everything i was working at from a very high level and from that, he had some very good questions and he really helped to probe these companies as well. And also for the internal solution, he was very um, instrumental in finding what that approach would be. Um, to weigh up the costs, really, um, we needed to weigh up the cost of the DIY approach versus outsourcing. And from this, um, it's it was easier to say, okay, for one approach, which, which was external, uh, to outsource was cheaper, but to do it internally, the DIY approach was better. Uh, this is mainly down to um, restrictions for internal and external. So if you imagine a company making products only for their employees, uh, security isn't as much of an issue. But if you're making something like like for a bank or financial institution, and it's being exposed to the outside world, it's pretty serious. You need a lot of security there. You're talking about access to accounts. You're, you're talking about money. Um, so it needs to be strict. So process definition, uh, the tooling really shaped the process and that's very important for me to stress um, if you look at a process before tooling um, you're going to change uh, direction as well uh, depending on your workflow um, so the tooling defined how we would work to a large degree um, it also defined that we didn't need to use as many files um, for the old portal we were maintaining six or seven files for each product um, but with a certain tooling set we could use one file um, so that was one file, the API specification, and we were reusing content. So that was a much easier way to work. Um, I'll, I'll describe that a little bit more in a minute. I've got a nice diagram coming up. Uh, we needed to define and agree on ownership. Uh, again, I was a documentation manager, a technical writer coming in. Uh, we just needed to make an agreement that this documentation was part of the product, and that's how it should be maintained. Uh, tooling also enabled a compulsory review process. So when I defined what tooling we would use, which actually was the tooling sets that we had within the bank. Um, so we had a certain set of tooling that developers were already using, but they weren't using it for documentation. Uh, it was The process was quite simple here. They just used that tooling for the documentation and nothing changed. They had no learning curve. They just reused what they already had. It was very easy to bring about and they're quite happy with the change. But that tooling involved a compulsory review. It was embedded into that way of working and that tooling. So that really made the process a lot easier. Uh, I then documented the process. Um, it's good to have something on paper so people can see it. They know what's involved, how long something will take, what to do if they have an issue as well is quite important. And the API handbook. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, people didn't understand the full uh, development process and not just for documentation, for product. Um, so it turned into a big project and it's it's still actually in process. Um, we've defined an API handbook. Um, so that's an A to Z of how to make and publish um, an API to external or internal customers. So this is the diagram I mentioned. Uh, so this was the original way of working. Um, so just qu very quickly to talk about the main elements here, we have this API specification. Uh, this specification is human readable and it's machine readable and it's the blueprint really for all API products and API is application program interface. Um, and what the idea behind an API is, is that it abstracts the functionality and the actual internal workings. So uh, you can see here there's an elephant and a peacock. These represent companies. Uh, they can interact with uh, bank resources uh, without needing to understand what they're interacting with. All they need to know is how to interact with the uh, the gateway. So this portal provides access to a gateway and they know what messages to send to get a certain response. But the problem with this approach was that documentation was being created separately. Uh, you can see the documentation down here on the end. Um, and what we did rather than creating the file separately was to use the API specification itself. Um, so this was a requirement and we used that blueprint. We ran it through something called a pipeline. So that's an automation um, component. It rendered the API specification and then published the outputs to the API portal. So that sounds quite simplistic, but it saved a hell of a lot of work for everyone. Um, and it reused content rather than maintaining multiple sets of the same content. My takeaways from this again are tooling will shape your process. 
Um, I advise looking at tooling before looking at process. Build your process to use the existing tool set. As I mentioned earlier, um, we focused really on the tooling that people had. Um, we didn't want to create a resistance to it um, and the learning curve. Um, if you introduce new tooling, you're, you're going to make things a bit harder to start, maybe easier afterwards, but there's going to be resistance. It's another set of tools that people have to use. Um, generally, the developers are very happy with this because they were already using these tools. They like this idea of a doc as code approach um, and they like to maintain their content like docs uh, as code. They don't want to have to go to Confluence. Uh, they didn't want to have to maintain Word files. They, they didn't want any other format. They just wanted a simple way of working and not have to use new user interfaces. Uh, the process must make life easier. Uh, there was a big focus here. As it was, it was very complicated and we needed to make this simple. People needed to be happy about using it in order to use it. Uh, avoid gates. Uh, generally, when processes are made, we have a tendency to add external or internal reviews um, within a team scenario. So um, it's very regimented. Uh, it slows things down. Um, avoid gates where possible. Uh, gates is, is a point where someone has to do something and if they fail to do it, they have to do it again. The only gate that I recommend in process is a review process. That's essential. Whether or not you're strict on it, uh, whether you're strict on what you're reviewing, that's, that's, a, that's a different matter. But there should be a review in there and that's a review is compulsory. Whether or not it breaks the cycle is a different one. Uh, document it. Uh, really document the process. People need to be clear on what it is and they need to understand it and need to agree to it. Um, so on the development side, um, we had an external API portal and an internal one. For the external one, we decided to use a third-party provider. Uh, they were using uh, a tool called Drupal. We used Redoc, which is a really nice tool for rendering these API specifications. It is a nice little left nav, um, and that's fixed. So it's a sticky left nav. Um, we'd, we had a lot of documentation in our API specifications, and to use another tool like Swagger, UI, etc., it just missed that user experience. It was very hard to add that navigation and it was easier to use something that had it built in. Redoc also doesn't use a sandbox, so you don't have that trailed functionality, so you also don't need to connect up that functionality, so it makes things a lot easier. For the internal portal, again, we used the same solution, which was Redoc. This is quite beneficial because we could share um, the stylings that we were using for Redoc um, with the third-party provider and make it look the same way internally and externally. We used internal resources and components, and we had two internal developers working on it. The takeaways here, um, I wasn't involved in developing the product itself, um, but I did attend all of the stand-ups and demos. It's important to see how it's progressing. And at different points, when there's a demo, you can interact with it, you can see how it works, you can experiment it, um, and you can give feedback on that experimentation. I think that's really essential. If you want to keep track and make sure it's going the way you want, you have to attend these and you have to monitor it. And the best way is stand-ups. Ask questions in the stand-ups too if you have them. Uh, don't be afraid to get involved. I'd encourage it. Ensure that manual processes don't creep in. Um, this is always the case. It, it means less development. Um, and people are always very keen to do this because it means less cost, uh, less time development, and it's easier. Uh, where possible, try and avoid it. Sometimes you'll have to agree to it. But the more manual processes means the harder it is to maintain afterwards for everyone creating content. Uh, generally, publishing will be longer, so avoid these at all costs. Ensure that the solution aligns with the tools and the process. Um, so again, that's by attending these meetings and ensuring um, and just being a voice. You're being a voice for documentation and you're being a voice for the user. Uh, training and coaching. After developing this kind of a solution for people, um, we needed to focus on the content. And by doing this, I hosted a series of workshops. Um, in the workshops, I really make a point of involving everyone. Um, exercises during the workshop as well. Um, and laptops closed during discussions. And then provide support after that. Um, support and training after the workshops is very important. It's not enough to provide a series of workshops to people. Um, they'll, quick, they'll quickly fall into their old habits again afterwards. And to raise awareness. Um, every opportunity I had really, I spoke or I presented something. Um, every team meeting every uh, town hall, etc. I really made a point of getting the documentation message out there because it was a new area for the bank. Uh, my takeaways, um, make content interactive and relatable for training content. Um, ensure that everyone's laptops are closed. Uh, use exercises. 
uh, exercises seems like a, a burden in these type of workshops, but it's the only way to ensure that they're really paying attention um, and they seem to enjoy it a little. Um, use the logic of language as well. Um, for a developing group, if they can relate to a formula, a clear way of writing that relates exactly back to something that's based and founded in logic, uh, it turns into a little competition um, and they try to compete against each other who can do things in the most efficient way or the optimal way. Uh, optimization would be a good word here, I think. Um, and recap questions. After certain points in the slide deck, um, stop and ask questions. Ask what's wrong with this word. Uh, why not use this word in a sentence? Or by using this word, how does it appear to a user? How could it be misinterpreted? Um, try and involve people as much as possible. Provide support afterwards. Uh, for me, I found that the editorial support was quite good. So by simply um, uh, providing uh, the, the tool chain that we were using already had this incorporated. So I could simply provide feedback. I first trained the team, then they started writing documentation, and then I was providing feedback and support in an editorial capacity. And was, this was through the tool set that we had defined. Make time for people. Uh, I'd really like to stress this one. Um, when you do a review um, and you don't get much feedback on it, but they just incorporate what the feedback was, um, always make time to follow up um, and do it in a way that you're encouraging them to tell, uh, make it open. In many cases, I, I find that they simply just incorporate what the feedback is without fully understanding it. They don't question it, or if they do question it, maybe they're not happy with the response. And it's always good to follow up. Um, they're looking to learn and you're looking to teach. Um, you need to create that scenario where you feel comfortable in having that quick conversation to find out why something wasn't appropriate. And creating resources. So you need to have a style guide. Um, for me, I went with the Microsoft Manual of Style. I made a condensed version of it and I made this available. Um, open source tooling, uh, there's a whole lot of it there and the tool set that we're using allowed for it as well. Um, so one I would recommend is a right good linter. It finds passives. Um, it's not always right, um, but it is a good indication on when a sentence should be restructured. I provided training content in those workshops, but I also made that training content available. Uh, read out loud tools. I advised all of my authors that um, when you're writing something and you're really stuck, it's not really making sense to you, um, change the medium. So stop looking at it and start listening to it. Uh, there are a lot of these plugins there. They're like downloadable to your desktop. So copy paste the text in and listen to the wording. Uh, you'll quickly find out what's wrong with it. Cheat sheets really uh, speed up the process. So it's the main goals for documentation. Um, rather than reading the entire style guide, I put the main points on this and they could go to a certain link for more information if they needed to understand it. Uh, the API handbook, so that's a massive undertaking. It's still a work in process. So that's the API development process from start to finish, and it's being maintained by the teams who actually own those processes. Uh, so there's a lot of mediation involved there, and it's a learning process for all involved, myself included. Uh, in terms of linting tools, um, I really needed to think about helping versus hindrance. Um, so if you have a pipeline, something that runs a publishing process, and you have something in the middle that breaks it if something doesn't meet a certain criteria, it's not really helping the person. So if they write something, they're happy with it, and they push, and then you say no, um, and you're saying no because a full stop is missing, or a word is misspelled, or one link is broken, uh, that's not the best approach. Um, what I found that the best place to lint was locally. Um, so I provide them with tools to lint on their own machine um, so that they can lint before they push. And if they push, maybe use a script instead of a linter, a script that goes through and, and checks that certain letters are capitalized, uh, the full stops are where they're supposed to be, etc. So automate it rather than stopping something. Um, again, that is a gate, it's a blocker, um, and always try and avoid these type of walls. It slows things down and really frustrates people. Um, look out for automation possibilities, and that's something I did um, everywhere possible. Uh, I'm still looking for those. Um, a lot of automation really is based on the tool chain that you're using. So the tooling that you use, the way of working, how you handle versioning, um, that's going to enable or disable certain automation possibilities. And that's something to bear in mind when you're in that process. Uh, so the destination, uh, we're not there yet. Um, we are kind of there. Um, I, I think this is a journey that we'll never really get to a complete conclusion. Uh, we're always going to try and strive to do better and get there faster. So we have one internal API portal with a Docker's code workflow. Uh, developers create and maintain all of the content. It's all automated. 
Uh, and the same for the external portal. Um, there is an involvement there in that there's editorial review and there are certain points where someone needs to push a button to publish, but that's purely because it's going to external customers. 90% uh, 90, 90 of the API development process is defined, so that's the API handbook. Um, that's a really good resource to people and I'm getting a lot of good feedback on that because it was something that they missed. Um, authors have resources and support, so they have things, they can go there, they can get what they need, they can plug and play. And if they need support, they have someone to reach out to. Uh, they have someone to fight their corner, really, when it comes to documentation. And authors are proud of their work. Uh, this is a pretty big one. Uh, when I first started, they had no pride in the work. They didn't enjoy it. They just wanted to get documentation done, finished, and get it away. Um, but now they seem to have a lot of pride in it. Um, they often um, pull me up on certain points, and their, their um, thoughts process is quite interesting, and how they look at certain sentences and structures is getting interesting. Uh, they remind me of myself as well when I was starting out in technical writing. Um, it, it seems like it's a whole new world has opened, you know. It's quite exciting. Company maturity. Um, it's starting to look at documentation like a serious industry now and understanding that it's it's a big area and it's it's something the bank needs to improve on. And COVID-19 is COVID-19 has been bad for everyone, of course, but for companies in some ways it's it's been good because they realize now just how important documentation is and uh, how, that they need to invest in it. Um, a lot of people now are working remotely and it looks like it's going to go that way for a long period of time. Um, so they're dependent on this documentation, and this knowledge, uh, undocumented knowledge is lost. Um, so in that point of view, I think it's really helping this company to understand how important documentation is. Uh, I just quickly want to give one image credit. So that first image that I used, um, that's by a guy called Philip McEarlin. Uh, so that's the credit. Um, and those are my slides. So thanks for listening, guys. I want to start with like kind of an age old question that someone proposed, which is tooling before process or figure out the process and then get the tools to match. What do you think? I think when you gather your requirements, you'll figure that out pretty quickly. Um, Based on those requirements, you'll have to use a certain tool range. Uh, it, it's going to implement, it, it's going to affect it either way. Um, but I think based on your research, you'll figure out pretty quickly what your options are. Okay, okay. And then also um, another question that seemed to be really popular in the chat was mm -hmm. whether or not you have any tips for helping people see how to get enjoyment out of the writing process. So like, you know, if they don't see the right way at first, how can you help them? I don't know. What do you think? Uh, for me, they were already documenting and they really knew. So it was something they were doing, they found difficult, um, and they just reinvented it each time. They weren't using any templates or anything like that. Um, so once we did a training session and once we agreed that with management, um, they were allotted some time and I just made it kind of fun. And these are all very logical people, so they like to understand the formula, they want to understand why a certain thing is a certain way. And once they started competing with each other, uh, they saw it as a puzzle, and, and that's where they found the enjoyment. And that, that really worked. Okay, but they were already documenting. Do you have any tips for like if you need mm -hmm. someone to be documenting, but you need to kind of yeah. get them into that process? You need to get management on board for that from what I've experienced. Uh, they need to have time. Um, it needs to be allocated. It needs to be kind of prioritized. And that's something I encountered as well. So they were documenting, but not doing it any way well. It was really poor. Um, okay. And they weren't being allotted time to do the work. Um, so that was, that was problematic for me. Yeah, absolutely. And then kind of on this topic of, you know, interacting with colleagues and creating a good team culture, Especially in, you know, these times, these pandemic sure. times of, you know, people being really stressed out mm -hmm. and fatigued and probably overworked, to be very honest. How do you mm -hmm. keep up, like, a good communication flow and candor within your team? Um, so within the team of documentation people, it's just myself and, and my colleague Brendan. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, like, a review process So every time some work is done. Um, there's default reviewers on all work, and that's myself and Brendan. We do like a weekly status update on certain projects. Um, so in that, we go through tasks, ask people if they need help. Uh, every now and again, shoot people a quick message. We use Teams for instant message. Um, so just on that, maybe short meetings here and there. 
just to, to check in with them, see how they're getting on. It's important to keep that personal touch and to keep that connection. They need you to be approachable and need to understand that you're there to help. Um, one point about COVID for documentation, it's it's never been more important. Um, and I, I think as documentarians, it's it's our job really to, to preach that to our companies and help them to understand because nobody else is really going to do that. Um, and we're so dependent on documentation now that everybody's remote. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. No, that that really makes sense. Um, and then, like, you mentioned, you know, you're on a small team. Are you the only one mm -hmm. reviewing the documentation? Like, how do you manage this, and how do mm -hmm. you communicate your, like, feedback to various people? Yeah, it's just myself and my colleague Brendan at the moment. Um, so we can't review everything. Um, there's just too much. We've got hundreds of APIs. So we we focus on certain areas. Our, our main focus is external APIs. So I think at the moment that's about ten public and maybe another ten partner APIs. Uh, internal, it's like when we can we help, and the API handbook that's full of processes. That's a huge undertaking. So yeah, most of our work is between that, uh, doing workshops with teams. So we're constantly approached by teams. Um, they they hear about what we're doing um, and they want support and they ask us questions that we can't really help them with because we don't have time. Um, but we do our best. Uh, I can't imagine dealing with that many APIs and all these people. <laughs> it really sounds like... I, I like a challenge. It's good. Really, it sounds like a lot of stress. Mm. But mm. as long as you enjoy it, that's <laughs> um, All right. How do you... Like, we kind of talked about... I asked you a little bit about this earlier, but I really mm. want to dive in because it's come up a few times in the questions. Um, how do you encourage, you know, or teach technical writing to engineers who are either really resistant or really uninterested in docs and don't see, I guess, the business value behind it? Mm. You mentioned involving management, but maybe a little, maybe like how and what would you pitch, I guess? Yeah, if the team has to make some documentation, and I think it's part of any product, you have to make documentation, whether it's internal for the team or whether it's, uh, internal within the company or whether it's going to be external. Um, you need to convince management of its importance. Uh, I think that's the battle. And once that's in place, the priority is assigned and people have time to do the tasks. You do have a certain group of people, they just really hate the whole idea. They don't want to be making docs. Uh, they want to be working on code. But if you can relate the documentation down to logic and make it kind of interactive so they're competing against each other about why a certain word is appropriate and why it's not, and certain things that they've been doing wrong for years without realizing. Um, if you can get through, it, it does take some time. Some people just won't, you won't get through. But I think the majority, 90%, once you understand the logic and that it's like a puzzle, and they want to do it as effectively as they can, and they want to make yeah. their content really easy to understand. Um, but that's it, make it interactive. Uh, make sure they're interacting with you. Don't allow people to use laptops, uh, take phones. Well, don't take them off them, but discourage it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit harder when it's remote because obviously they have to use a laptop. Um, what I do is I use a tool called Menti. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interactive quiz tool. Um, and then I can check, okay, they're logged in, they're answering these questions. And then I get them to answer, like to explain a bit about certain answers and what their opinions are on that. So involve people, make it interactive, um, and try and make it fun. Makes sense. Do you think it's the same for when you're adopting style, um, like style guides or handbooks, or do you think you take a different approach to that? Yeah, it's the same approach. Okay. Um, like as part of the training, you're, you're indoctrinating them into this way of doing something, and you need to have a point of reference, um, and, and that's just this style guide. Cool. Excellent. So unfortunately, we're out of time, and we still had a lot of questions, especially on like good examples of those oh, kind yeah. of style guides and handbooks. Sure. Um, mm. How can people get in touch with you? Where will you be? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I, I can share spot. some details. I think that's probably best. I'll okay. share my email. Sounds good. So cool. for everyone else, watch out for that in the chat and then be back in about five minutes for our next talk. And thank you so much, Chris, for thank having you. For being here, I almost said having us. <laughs> Thanks for having us. It's We're been happy a great experience. You, all of it. I've watched this from afar for years, so it was nice to take part. <laughs>